Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. A case can be made that the Middle East is going through a realignment as significant as any since lines were drawn on maps 100 years ago or since the state of Israel was created in 1948. New political and economic relationships between key Arab countries and Israel, reduced U.S. dependence on Middle East oil coinciding with reduced U.S. engagement in the region, apparent reduction in the threat of Islamic fundamentalism, growing confidence that local leaders, not those in Washington, London, Moscow, or elsewhere, can best manage peace and security in the region. A new set of realities is emerging. Ambassador Youssef Aloteba is the United Arab Emirates' long-serving ambassador to the United States. He is also a key player in the process of creating this new Middle East. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Alan. It's great to be with you. Yousef, I'm thinking of stealing Dean Atchison's present at the creation as a headline for this conversation, since I think you literally have been and are present at the creation of this new Middle East. Do you think I'm exaggerating how dramatically the region is changing? I, I don't think you're exaggerating, but I think it's still too early to predict just how deep and how serious that realignment really is and what it means. I think historians will judge this, you know, pundits will judge this. I think we are in the very, very early stages of what could be sort of reimagining what the Middle East looks like and how it operates. Um, what I've watched over the last several years is just is a shift in mindset, a shift in attitude. Younger people are tired of conflict. They're tired of ideology. They want solutions. They want jobs. They want what every young person around the world wants. And I think this is either a result of that shift in mindset, or it's going to trigger an increasing shift in that mindset. I don't know if it's the result or a consequence of it. We, Like I said, it's still too early to tell. But if you look at data, if you look at polls, if you talk to young people, they all want the same thing. You know, what does the future look like? Are we going to have better schools? Are we going to have better infrastructure? Are we going to have better health care? Uh, and that, I think, what the Abraham Accords can help provide more research, more technology, more programs about space and agriculture and technology. And so I, I think if we depoliticize the Abraham Accords to the extent we can, this is about sort of opportunities. That's how I saw it. You were deeply involved in the negotiation of the Abraham Accords, and which in the declaration talks about, and I quote, a culture of peace among the three Abrahamic religions. In your own country's treaty with Israel commits both nations to, quote, lasting peace, stability, security, and prosperity. Those are amazing words, given the background of the last 75 years. Um, partly, you just argued that it's coming from what people actually want. But, but whose idea was it? Who turned it into reality? And, and, and how real is it, do you think? So I think it's real if we make the necessary efforts to make it real. It's not going to happen on its own, right? The region is not just going to get better and become more stable unless we work at it. I think we, to be quite honest, we just took advantage of an opportunity. Uh, I think there was a moment where Israel was contemplating annexing lands in the West Bank. Uh, I thought that was going to have a drastic impact and a drastically negative impact, not just on the region, but on Israel, on, on America, because America was going to have to defend this incredibly unpopular decision. So what we were trying to do is really avert what I thought would be you know, a bad outcome. And the way we averted it was to trade it up and do something that ultimately suspended annexation into something that created a win-win for everyone, the UAE, the US, Israel. And now we just kind of make sure that that win-win-win is actually delivering for the people in the region. That requires a lot of work. It's, like I said, it's we're eight, nine months into this. The signs and indicators are very promising, but you know we need to work hard to make this a success. Fair point, but clearly all is not milk and honey in the region. There is deep tension between the Palestinians and Israel. 
as demonstrated in the recent fighting and between Iran on the one hand and your country and other Gulf countries on the other. Let's take those in two pieces. Um, first, the West Bank, Palestinians, Gaza. There is an accusation, I think unfair, but it's a question to you, that the Abraham Accords left the Palestinians to solve their own problems, which is part of the reason why the riot and the repression on Al-Aqsa led to the Hamas rocket attacks. Where do the Palestinians fit into this? Uh, what is the future for them in this new accord? I think the Palestinians can stand to benefit from whatever outcomes come out of the Abraham Accords. But let's backtrack before that. Let me ask you a question that if the Abraham Accords had not occurred and annexation had proceeded, what would the future of Palestine look like if Israel had proceeded to annex 10, 15, 20 percent of the 30 percent that they were asking for? What would the Palestinian situation look like? What would the two state solution look like today in June? of 2021 had annexation proceeded. Uh, I think that question does not get asked or answered frequently enough, to be honest. I think we have always been big advocates of the two-state solution. We continue to be advocates of the two-state solution. In fact, I can make a very compelling argument that the Abraham Accords actually salvaged the two-state solution. Now, having said that, it is going to require concessions from both sides. If peace is going to be made, Israel is going to have to make some compromises. The Palestinians are going to have to make some compromises in order to get to peace. Now, <laughs> I'll pose the question back to you. Do you think that's feasible in this environment? I don't think it's any less feasible in this environment than it was in the prior environment. Well, we were in a cul-de-sac, a diplomatic cul-de-sac with nothing happening. And now your argument is clear, something could happen. Whether it does or not is up to the parties is up to the creativity of people like you and people who are involved in trying to actually solve problems as opposed to write headlines. There's no shortage of willingness from third parties to help, to assist, to support, to advise. But if this issue was going to be resolved by a third party, by Egypt, Jordan, or even the UAE, or the US or the UN, this issue would have been resolved a long time ago. Uh, you know, it's, it's up to us to help, but we cannot make this decision. Like I said, this is going to require the two parties to come in and face reality and say, yeah, both sides are going to have to make some uncomfortable and tough decisions if we really want to make this happen. Now, we will keep pushing and helping. I think we have been, even in the last uh, most recent operation in Gaza, we were, we were helpful. We were sending the right messages. We encouraged uh, people to, to embrace the Egyptian ceasefire proposal which they ultimately did. So yes, we can be influential, but you know it's going to ultimately come back to the two parties to decide whether they want to proceed or not. Well, and to pull on something that you just said, it was an Egyptian proposal, and that is the first time in a while that we've seen creative diplomacy coming out of Cairo, which may well be part of this new Middle East we're talking about. I think so, and I will give the Egyptians a lot of credit. They are the only country that has the trust, the leverage, the relationships, the access to all the parties here to make this happen. And I was very impressed that they took the lead and more impressed that everyone actually followed and supported the Egyptian pr proposal. Let's shift gears to the other paradigm that has dominated thinking for some time, which is the confrontation, air quotes on that word, between Sunni states and Shia states, between Iran and the Arab countries of the Gulf, the United Arab Emirates, Saudis, et cetera. That's been the defining fault line for years in the Middle East, or at least the perceived defining fault line. But recently, that confrontation seems to have become less intense, certainly less provocative and much less in the headlines. That could be about internal Iranian politics, but it could also be a shift in the relationship between the two sides of the Arab Gulf. What do you think? So I think we have chosen to want to live in a more stable and peaceful environment. Now, you can connect a lot of the dots that have happened in the last few years, our withdrawal from Yemen, our you know, initiating peace with Israelis, our de-escalating with a lot of the people that we often disagree with. But we were trying to create a more prosperous and more stable environment. And you only do that by having a little more dialogue by trying to bring the temperature down and talking to those 
even those who you have disagreements with. But I would want to challenge a little bit of the premise that you mentioned earlier, which is that the fault line tends to be the Sunni Shia split, or oftentimes the Arab Persian split. I, I personally do not believe in that. I believe that the actual fault line in the region is really about a religious society or a secular society, a forward looking country or a backward looking country, a country that spends you know, the majority of its time thinking about its future plans versus a country that spends most of its time thinking about its past history. And I think that's the difference. That's the fault line. You can, you can choose to categorize whatever countries in which camp you want, but I think the more countries focus on their future, plan for a better future, work on their economy, creating jobs, creating opportunities, those are the countries that ultimately, I think, A, are going to succeed, and B, people want to move and live in, live with. I think that's the real fault line, not not just Sunni Shia ideology. I think that's an oversimplification. Uh, fair enough, but we are on the cusp of new Iranian elections, and I won't ask you to comment. Um, we may be on the cusp, though, also of a, a there will be an eventual shift to a new supreme leader. Um, all of the signals that seem to be coming out of Iran are consistent with a country that at least at the leadership level, wants to remain really quite religious in your religious versus secular um, dichotomy. Is that fair or am I missing changes that are ongoing? Yeah, I think the revolution is part of Iran's identity. I think that's part of who they are. But that can also mean that we can talk to them and work with them and de-escalate. I mean, that's... Choosing to be religious does not mean choosing to be confrontational. On the contrary, I think you can be religious and have multiple conversations. Uh, let's see if that happens. But I, I think we are trying to figure out ways to work with everyone in our region for the sake of increasing the stability in the Middle East. Well, and as an observer, it seems that you're pushing on an open door. Obviously, we already talked about the Israelis. Uh, but also with the Iranians. The, the, the temperature really does seem to have fallen dramatically recently. Um, and I'm sure that's reflective think, of a lot of hard work on your part and, and on others, other people's part. I, I think it has, for sure. Um, and I, I think, I've said this before, you know, if we can improve the relationship between us and Iran or us and any other country that we have disagreements with, the UAE specifically is poised to benefit from a normal relationship with Iran more than anyone else. The amount of trade, the amount of investment, the amount of cooperation, the amount of tourism that we can have with Iran, if we can find a, a working relationship that no one, no one will benefit more from that kind of relationship, from that kind of Iran than the UAE. So I, there, the potential is there if we can find a functional lane to work with. In that context, I assume that means that you would welcome a renegotiated or reinstated, whatever the right re word is, nuclear deal with Iran. I yeah, I think so. If we can reach a, a solution that makes everyone happy and addresses all the issues that we, we are concerned about, I think that would be a good outcome. But we were not in the JCPA negotiations the first time around. We're not in them this time. So we're kind of just watching from the... Uh, from the stands, as you see, and hopefully something positive comes out of it. I think it's a good playing field to stay off of, quite frankly. <laughs> Much better to watch that one. Yeah. Uh, let me shift to the external powers. Uh, since Napoleon showed up in Egypt in 1798, foreign powers have played, I would argue, too important a role, too dominant a role in shaping the region for their own purposes, for better and for worse. My sense, though, is that one of the big changes is that there is less foreign influence, starting with the Americans, or rather that it's fading. Uh, is that fair? Do you agree? I, I mean, I haven't. I've heard it being debated. I've heard it academically, intellectually. I've heard, oh, the U.S. is the Middle East is not as important to the U.S. as it used to be. There is a big political debate inside the U.S. of what the U.S. role in the world should be. And that's been going on for like many years. That's, don't, that's not a recent development. Uh, the question is, is, it's not whether the U.S. should or should not be engaged. It's what does that engagement look like? What are we going to be engaged on? Is it just security and military troops? Because in that sense, really, with the exception of withdrawal from Afghanistan, really, it, 
the U.S. posture in the region hasn't changed much. So I'm not worried about the size of the U.S. military footprint in the region. I don't think that's as big of a barometer as it's made out to be. I want to see more engagement on climate. I want to see more engagement on culture. I want to see more engagement on economy and trade and investment. I think it's in the region's best interest to have a much more diverse relationship with the United States on all levels, not just military and security. I want to see a huge U.S. presence at Expo 2021. Well, it's called 2020, but it's occurring in 2021, um, where the U.S. is going to have a very attractive pavilion for a six-month world fair for everyone to see. I, I think that posture is just as important, if not more important, than the military footprint. And I hope the U.S. officials see it the same way. Uh, this is a great way to show U.S. commitment to the region by engaging on climate, by engaging on pandemic, by engaging on expo and multilateral things like that. So I, I, I measure it in a different way than just, well, how many aircraft carriers do you have in the region? If you feel that the world lacks global leaders, please help support the Talberg Foundation programs. Individual donations are being accepted at talbergfoundation.org slash donate. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org slash donate. You sit in Washington, so you are well aware that there is a kind of Cold War mindset developing, that geopolitics is a zero-sum game, Either the U.S. has advantage or China has advantage or Russia has advantage. What do you see the role of China and Russia in your region? Arguably, Russia has not had a major presence for a long time, but, but clearly is back. And the Chinese are, are quite visible in economics, in politics, even in culture. I think, uh, I'm not sure who came up with this, but, but nature abhors a vacuum. If there is a vacuum naturally someone will come in to exploit the vacuum. And so I, I just think it needs to be understood that, you know, there are other players in the world that will seek to kind of replace the United States one day if the United States decides to leave. That's just the way it works. Uh, having said that, I, I just think the U.S. plays a fundamentally positive role in the region, at least from our perspective. When the U.S. deployed in a variety of coalitions, and not just in the region, to even Kosovo, we deployed with them. So I think the U.S.-UAE relationship is not at risk from other players, at, at least from my perspective. But it's important to understand that you know the U.S. also has competition from other countries. So the U.S. has to make that judgment, has to make that evaluation of what's in its interest and what's not in its interest. And I think that's that's a you know big power competition or debate that is way above <laughs> our pay grade. But I think the region is off to a good path. And we look at other countries sometimes as partners on certain things. There are a lot of items that we look at commercially, not politically. And when we look at China, for example, we look at a country that is the second largest economy in the world, that is the largest trade partner for the UAE, largest direct investor in the UAE, and so we look at them as an economic opportunity to diversify our economy further and further away from oil and gas. It's a country we want to work with on an economic track uh, to make sure that the UAE economy gets stronger by the day. You've emphasized from the start of this conversation the importance to you, the importance to the leadership of the United Arab Emirates um, of economics, of creating new opportunities for your youth. The region is, has an incredibly young population uh, you need jobs in the future. You need less dependence on oil and gas. And the Emirates has been a leader in that transformation. Um, do you think your partners, the Americans, the Chinese, others, the Turks, who knows, understand that this is a new Middle East? I think so. Yes, I really do. And I'm going to, you know, through the span of our conversation, I'm sure that I'm going to continue going back to how important the economy is for the UAE in 2021 and going forward. Our focus right now, uh, for a lot of reasons, of which a main one is the pandemic and the impact of the pandemic on our economy, is we are going through a series of reforms, 
uh, adjustments, legal, social, regulatory, to make sure that the UAE economy is as strong as possible and as resilient as possible. What we learned from the pandemic is yeah, we weren't as strong or resilient as we would have liked to be. And so we really need to double down on the economy. We really need to double down on investments, on GDP, on trade. And so you see a lot of things happening. If you look at it from the outside, you could probably say, you know, that reform here and that reform there, those are not connected. In reality, uh, a lot of what we're doing is part of a bigger plan to make the UAE economy very strong and very competitive in the region. So I, I think the next two or three years are going to witness a dramatic, dramatic increase and in strengthening of the economy of the UAE. I'm very optimistic and very bullish on this. You know the United States in general and Washington in particular better than any foreigner I know. And I know a lot of foreigners. <laughs> I'm tempted to ask you to contrast the Obama, Trump, and Biden administrations, but you're way too good a diplomat to answer any question I could imagine. So let me instead ask about the future. What role would you like the U.S. to play five years from now in your region? If you could write the marching orders for some future Secretary of State, not, not in this administration, but after this administration, yeah. what would you ever do when it comes to the Middle East? Well, first, I think the U.S. role is critically important. Uh, I don't think that's going to change today, tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now. I think it's really important for any Secretary of State or any President of the United States to understand that despite the US you know, relying less on oil from the region, despite the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, that the Middle East is still important strategically, politically, economically, you want the future of the Middle East to look brighter, and that's where the U.S. needs to be engaged. It needs to be engaged on climate. It needs to be engaged on pandemics. It needs to be engaged on social issues. It needs to be engaged on culture and art. It needs to be engaged on... Yeah, we typically define engagement these days by, by a shallow standard. It's, it's military. It's just, you know, it's how many troops do you have in the region? And I think the future of the region demands more of the U.S. soft power engagement. And I think we need to do much more of that. I really do. I think we need to see more students coming to the U.S. to study and vice versa, vice versa. One of the biggest accomplishments I've seen in the Emirates in the last, I'd say, 15 to 20 years was the creation of NYU, New York University, Abu Dhabi. This was like a dream. This was a vision. And it was a vision by former president of NYU, John Sexton, who wanted to create basically like a world-class institution that brought students from around the world, which is exactly what we did. The only thing was it exceeded the expectations of our expectations and Sexton's expectations. You have some of the smartest, smartest students in the world studying at NYU Abu Dhabi. Now there's only about 16, 1700 of them, but guess what? Now they all want to stay in the UAE and work there. Those students who have, you know, gotten 4.0s for the last four years at one of the best universities in the world want to stay and apply what they've learned and their intelligence and their skills to our country. To me, that is a huge, a huge breakthrough. Why aren't more American students studying at NYU? That's something that has immeasurable results. You cannot put a dollar value on having two, 300 students graduate every year that want to stay in the Emirates and work. That is what the U.S. should be focused on, improving education, improving, working on climate change issues, working on making sure that there's no future pandemics, or at least if there is, that we're all much better prepared for it. I think that's where we should be focused. That's what I would advise the next Secretary of State to focus on. <laughs> So the problem, as you well know, is that Washington is a busy place. How do you get the attention to the region in a positive way, as opposed to in the old mindset kind of way? Is a summary of your job description as ambassador, I assume. Yeah. So I've, in my humble experience here in Washington, I've learned that seeing is believing. You and I can sit on this podcast for 30 minutes or 30 hours and talk about how great NYU Abu Dhabi is. It is no comparison or no substitute for five minutes on campus 
with these kids. Really, it's it's night and day. I can talk about how great it is, but until somebody actually goes and does a discussion or meets these young guys and girls, it, you don't really get to understand how impactful it is. You know, when someone goes and sees the Abrahamic family house, which is just basically a construction site right now, the impact of the Abrahamic family house to me is... It's something I have not seen in the region in a very long time. Here you have a government in the, in the Gulf who's basically putting its own government funds to build a synagogue, a church, and a mosque side by side. Why? So people can understand that these three institutions, that these three religions can actually go coexist peacefully. We're trying to send the message that this is possible, that this is feasible, even in, a, you know, in, even in the region. I think sending these messages, whether it's NYU, Abu Dhabi, whether it's the Abrahamic Family House, whether it's a peaceful nuclear program, I think it's very important for people to understand not only how they're happening, but why they're happening. And that's why I keep encouraging people to come visit. You know, we have a great opportunity with Expo coming up in October. You know, we expect about 20 to 25 million visitors. I, I hope it's much more than that. I hope people come get to see the country and what we're trying to do whether it's our space program or Expo or the Abrahamic Family House. People need to understand why this is happening. What's the motivation? What, what kind of future we envision for the region? And, and those are all just markers on sort of a journey towards a better future. Towards a much better future, potentially. Final question. What keeps you up at night? What's your biggest worry about achieving that kind of new Middle East, that kind of new United Arab Emirates. Yeah. So it's, to be blunt, it's just, it's ignorance. I worry about ignorance. I worry about lack of understanding. I worry about people who, who don't understand it and then, you know, just criticize it from 7,000 miles away. Um, I think social media can play either a very helpful role or a very harmful role. I tell my young diplomats and staff and, you know, our students in a talk a couple of days ago, I said, one of the best pieces of advice I've been given and I've given back is try to always, when you're having a debate or a discussion, try to put yourself, even for like a few minutes, put yourself in the shoes of the person you are debating, put yourself in their position, try to understand where they're coming from. Try not to judge, try not to, you know, presuppose what you think they're coming from. Try to just put yourself in the other person's shoes and appreciate their position. It will make for a much better conversation. It will make for better understanding and hopefully more respect. And so I hope people can just try to understand what we're doing. That's what it, it's not what keeps me up at night as, as much as it bugs me. And so try to cut come in with an open mind and try to come in and understand what it is we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. I think that's an excellent point. My biggest worry is that so few, in the first instance, Americans, but I think more generally Europeans as well, are aware of how dramatic the changes in the region have already been and could well be. I think there is a tendency to stay in the history books. Uh, the recent history books, and to assume that the frame is fixed forever. Yeah, I, I think we're trying to approach issues, longstanding issues, right, with a completely different lens, with a new lens, with a more progressive, open, you know, problem-solving type of approach lens. You know, you, whether it's the Abraham Accords or Expo, we're, we're all about providing solutions, creating prosperity, enhancing stability. We're trying to ask people to look at what we're doing with a fresh pair of eyes. You know, we're, we've essentially are going from analog to digital. <laughs> and, not, and I mean this metaphorically, I mean on the entire scale of the country. We are really moving at a different speed, especially when it comes to the economic issues. Um, I hope people can actually try to understand what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. But like I said, you know, sometimes that requires a, an in-person visit, some, some conversations with some of our officials, but also some of our students, some of our young people. I, I spent about an hour and a half talking to a group of young diplomats, upcoming diplomatic students in our diplomatic academy two days ago. 
And I, I find these conversations enlightening because I learn from them as much as they learn from me, maybe more. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Thank you for what you're trying to do. And all I can say is inshallah. Thank you, Alan. It's great to be with you. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcast and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation.